All right, buddy. Okay. Uh, buddy, you okay? Is he all right? What's going on back there? Come here. Come on out. No, he doesn't have to come out. He can stay there. What were we talking about? <laughs> Do you guys have any questions right off the bat? Sure, shoot. Oh, it's done like this. Okay. Yeah, okay. Hi, Colin. I understand that you went with Misha Collins to Haiti. Uh, I did. To build an orphanage. So I was just wondering if you could talk about how that came about and what the experience was like. Oh, he emotionally blackmailed me to go to Haiti. <laughs> like, Sounds like him. You know, he's, he's, he's Misha. I met Misha. Do you guys know who Misha Collins is? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I met Misha about 15 years ago at a hardware store. Um, I, we were both renovating, and uh, so we, we sort of commiserated about construction and whatnot, and then our, our careers sort of went off in, in similar directions. Um, so he called me up and he said, yeah, I, you know, would you go to Haiti? And how do you, you know, would you go to Haiti to build an orphanage? Like, who's allowed to say no? <laughs> you know, no, I won't, I'm super busy. Um, so. So I, I, so I did, and it was, cr it was crazy. I mean, he built this thing. This isn't like, like a duplex orphanage. This thing is made, I guess the engineer is a, uh, did some of the subways in New York, and this thing is built like, this thing will never, ever fall down. It has so much concrete in it, and then I guess 300 kids live there. I don't know the numbers. 20,000 children live in this one. No, they don't. Um, so, so it was great, um, and it's a, it's a country that needs a lot of help. So... That's, I guess, what happened um, at the end of the day. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Hello. What's up? I was just wondering what your favorite crazy invention was from Eureka. My favorite crazy invent. Well, there's, it, it's gotta be more than one. Fair. I'm a greedy sort of person. <laughs> so I think, I mean, it's, it's gotta start with uh, like the hoverboard, just for fun, right? But then there's a spaceship. So you can't not choose the spaceship, you know, that goes mm. to space, right? <laughs> so that'd be super cool. As well as um, the teleportation machine to teleport to your spaceship that's in orbit. So really, they all work that hoverboard around the spaceship. So yes. they all work together, I, I think. Oh. Is he having fun or is he angry? <laughs> uh, bad dad. Um, All right. Thank so I guess you. The, yeah, those, I guess those are my those are those are my choices. Thank you. Nice. Hi. I'm Vicky. Hi, Vicky. I'm it's, Colin. I know. <laughs> it's really cool. Um, I'm gonna be a good little fan girl. I'm be honest. Okay. Um, I didn't know you were until you were started on the Vampire Diaries. Yeah. Which Scares the crap out of me every week, so <laughs> thanks for that. I'm sorry and, or good? No, I'm not sure what my response should be. You do a really good job. Thanks. And my question was about that character. Um, obviously, what your character is doing are some really hor horrible things. Like, spoiler alert, you burn people alive in a van. Okay? So, I do. obviously, that's a bad thing. So, how do you reconcile? Like, how do you get yourself in the mindset to play a character who's doing really horrible, evil things? Yeah, you made that clear. I do horrible, and like, horrible. And like, but he thinks he's doing the right thing. Yeah. Because Trump actually is like a really cool guy that I, think I he would is. like to have coffee with. But <laughs> at the same if time. If it wasn't for all the murder. Right. Exactly. So like, how do you balance that? Um, you do a really good job. I guess strangely, Easily, um, I sort of think of it as, as he. Um, I always approach those characters on a serious answer. I always approach those characters from uh, the standpoint of they think this is the right thing to do. So we all have things in our life that you know. Well, this is going to be hard, but it's the right thing to do. You know, so you go and do it. Like coming to Halifax, I'm, I'm here for five weeks. I'm shooting Haven. Had to bring the family. Uh, yeah. Um, and it's it's going to be hard, but it's the right thing to do. You know, you got you, you got to keep. So same thing with murder. Really, it's, it's difficult. Sometimes it makes me sad, but it's the right thing to do. Um, Thank you. So th that, that's how I kill all the vampires. Uh, um, it's a fun show, by the way, Vampire Diaries. I almost talked into this. Oh. Really nice cast, really good group of people. Um, and I'd, I'd recommend uh, taking a look at it. Not necessarily stuff that I'm in. I'm not like, you know, promoting it. 
But um, even though I probably should. But it's a, it's a good little show. So if you haven't seen it, um, tune in. It's neat. Thank you, Vicky. <laughs> Shoot. Hey there. Uh, I was told you do like writing as well as acting. And, um, and do you find there's any like kind of mental creative overlap when it comes to acting a character as opposed to writing them? Um, I, I do do some writing. I, I haven't done enough where I feel like I could speak with any degree of authority about, about like my process or, or the differences between. Um, I know that in acting, uh, it's, it's interesting because there's the character as they talk about it, and then there, which is generally different than the character you have to act. Because the character you have to act, I believe, no, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be even more bold, does. Um, the character you have to act has certain limitations, and they're, limita and they're limited by the plot. Whatever the plot needs them to do, they have to service. Either you're servicing another character, or you're servicing the plot, and those are the things that have to get done. And a lot of times, the character choices you make, or the character choices you don't make, you make to service those things, then you become the character that the plot needed you to be. The difficult thing is when you're, you're in season three and four and five, and all of a sudden, you know, the, it'll be like a new new um, group of writers and they'll start writing things and they think are right but you've made choices in the past and it violates some of those and that's when you hear crazy stories like the actor's refusing to do this thing and it's not they're not refusing to do the thing they're sort of saying yeah but in in season three you had me do this and and i can't you know to use vicky's thing you can't reconcile the two those two th things can't live in the same head so you're, you're always looking for the real estate to to act it I'm sure the writers come about it from, the same, from a similar standpoint when dealing with the network and notes and you know, the character they conceive and then all the, you gotta have five act breaks and the character's gotta do this and so it sort of gets thinned over time. Um, and so you're always trying to fight to keep it alive in some sense and keeps the, a shred of integrity with it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Hello. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. Good to see you too. Um, Thank we you. see each other a couple times a week. Yeah. Um, so, so two sort of fangirl questions. Um, you play characters very well. You play good characters, like really sweet characters. And then you can like, ask me any of these during the week. I see you. I like know, this. I know. I came up with them though just now. I hope um, they're good. Oh, God. They're not. They're really not. They're great. Um, which characters do you prefer? Like, or do you prefer the, the dynamic of both? That you play these really sort of nice guy, sweet characters, and then these very like Vampire Diaries, very dark. Um, I, I like I like them both. I, I like um, what I like about the the good character is that you're the moral compass for the show, and and you have a responsibility as that character to defend sort of good, not in the world of the show, but for the audience. And I found a lot of times when I was when I was on Eureka my um, comments or notes would be that can't happen because you know that's not the right thing to do and and if i'm going to be this character then then he has to do the right thing and especially in a show that people watch with their kids and mm -hmm. it's really nice to to be the the voice box for that um it's also a responsibility which gets tiring <laughs> enter in the murderer right which is <laughs> like like how fun is that where you're just how many kids are here? All right, I'll change my language. Um, where where you're, ju you're just not a nice person. Um, and if you can have as much fun as possible being not a nice person, that's an awful lot of fun to do. Because um, who doesn't love crossing a line and getting away with it? You know? Or maybe you don't, but I do. <laughs> so there's a character reveal. Also, I didn't realize you knew Misha Collins. Um, yeah. would, you, would you ever be interested in going on Supernatural? Sure, I'd love to work. I know all those guys, and they're really, really nice. And yeah. finally, like I've known Mark forever, and he's here this weekend. And um, I'd love to go and do, do that show. I can't believe they're still doing it. Like, <laughs> I get, not that it's like long in the tooth or anything, but like they've been working nights for a decade. Like that sucks. <laughs> so I just just figured like was, like they throw down at a certain point and go, yeah, we're daytime people now. <laughs> just so you know. And would you want to be a good guy or a bad guy on that show? Um. I would, because of my relationship with Misha, I would probably want to be antagonistic. Um, in whatever, whatever that made me, I'd do it, just to bug him. Because um, where is Castiel in the, in the, in the stream of things? Because he became human and now he's, that there, where is he right now? Anyone want to summarize it real quick? And, he's still pretty good? All right, then I want to be his boss. That would, that would, there's a dream come true. All right, thanks.
Hi. Hi. As a new parent. Yes. Now, right now, he doesn't, he sees you, but he doesn't understand what's going on. No. When he does start to understand, what ages for which shows would you permit him to watch? Ah. Oh. <laughs> I'm a parent. So yeah, I'm I know. I'm being judged by a whole room full of people. <laughs> awesome. Great. I believe that every child is different and special in their own way. And really, to make lines that sort of are true for all children would be wrong. So I really need to know who he is, you know, and let him develop. And maybe he'll tell me. Maybe I should do more listening than telling. Or mommy will tell you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Um, and, but I, honestly, I believe that. I think you can sort of start watching a show with him. And I mean, for, for Vampire Diaries, where, yeah, I kill a bunch of people by burning them to death, not soon. You know, maybe, maybe we'll leave that till he's four. Right. Um, now, he, you know, he's got to be old enough to be able to process that for sure. Like, could you imagine, though, he's watching this show and he's like... <laughs> Before he could process that it, was, that it wasn't real? Yeah, that'd be an awkward, silent house that night. Um, but I think Eureka, particularly in the later seasons, uh, first, the first season was a little rough sometimes. It was a little scarier than later seasons. But I think um, uh, that, that show I could get to early, um, depending on what he can handle and what he can process. Or maybe I should have said he's watched them all already. There's a bad dad. Yeah, he watches them live because he supports. Um, that'd be terrible. By the way, Eureka, just so you guys know, when we started for a season, the, the directors were um, sort of browbeaten by the network to say, like, this is not a comedy. We don't want to see jokes in there. This is a drama. We're coming off the heels of Battlestar, and that's our money. And that was what they told all the directors. And it was, it was sort of all the writers and, and us that, that kept throwing things in because it was free. Right? That was always the sell. Like, oh, the scene's not working. Well, if I make a joke, it's free. And they would, they would sort of bit, and then the show sort of went that way. So... Never listen to your bosses. That's the end of that story. Uh, you, believe it or not, you just had answered my question. Really? Because uh, I'm also clairvoyant, <laughs> just so you know. Well, I was going to ask because I felt like... Um, Seven. Yeah. <laughs> not bad. Yeah. I was going to say, I felt like it was really uh, sort of a darker feeling at the beginning, and I was wondering how you felt about the whole evolution between where... You know, I mean, the, the oh. sheriff in the first episode lost his legs, right, yeah. at the beginning, all that stuff, and then it was... It's Much a little dark. More. Yeah. Uh, he and got I, back, I love though. both parts, but uh, what do you thought of it? Yeah, I, I actually fought it along the way. Um, yeah. At the time, in my life, I wanted to do an edgier show, which is what they pitched, and they thought it was going to go really edgy. I kept doing the comedy because it kept me entertained you know, over the course of the day. I get super bored. So I, uh, I kept throwing stuff in, but I wanted it to be edgy. And then as the show sort of airs, and it's funny because you find the show when you meet the people who watch it because they'll say, oh, we like this, this, and this, and then you sort of, it's weird, because you, in, in acting, it's supposed to be, you perform in front of a group of people, and that instant connection takes the piece where it's supposed to go. That's the job. Um, but when you do it on television, there's no audience. So you shoot a whole season, and then you hear responses, and, and then you sort of go, oh, this is what the show is, and you end up going in that direction. So initially, I didn't want it to be a, um, a lighter show, but it became the thing I became most proud of. Um, hearing people say, you know, oh, it's one of the few shows that we as a family can watch, you know, without being scared that it's going to be horribly violent and, and all that stuff. And, um, and also it was one of the shows, I, this is less important in Canada, but um, they were allowed to watch uh, overseas, like in Iraq and, and all that. So there was a bunch, like when you're doing a convention and this couple comes up and they said, I was stationed overseas, I was in Iraq for a little while, I got injured, and it was one of the things that my wife and I could watch and we could talk about so we'd have something in common um, over the course of my thing. And, and what a humbling thing to be a part of. So, uh, you know, uh, so, so I fought it, but ultimately I loved it. Thank you. Thanks. It's a long-winded answer, huh? <laughs> this Ferguson guy, whoa, 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 whoa. He just goes on. Oh, hello. Hi. Yeah, I'm talking to you. <laughs> I was waiting for the mic. It was really high there. Um, oh. Well, I, I just wanted to say that I loved Eureka. It was Thank one of you. my favorite shows on television. Thanks. Thanks, guys. I appreciate that. Um, and fun fact, there is actually a, a little place in Nova Scotia called Eureka. Really? Yeah. You know, Have we, you been there? Yeah. 
You <laughs> bastards. <laughs> you call yourself. All right. Um, yeah. But. <laughs> yeah. Could you imagine think. showing up? Wow, is this ever disappointing? <laughs> <laughs> Went to the garage. Henry was nowhere to be found. But then I saw you in Haven, and you were bad. And I was I kinda, bad. And I kind of liked it. Yeah. <laughs> I like you. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> um, and I was so disappointed that you were only in for one season. So yeah. is there a possibility that you might be coming back, maybe? I shot last allowed? night with Lucas. Yeah? Uh, yeah. Really? Yeah, we were, beating each other, we were beating each other up in a cave. Uh, it was pretty fun. It went late. I'm tired. Um, and bruised, as is he. Um, no, it's really great. I, I came back and I directed one, and uh, they said, well, oh, you're in town. Do you want to um, act in a couple? So, so I'm acting in a couple now. I thought I would have come back at the beginning of season five. I thought that was yeah. not tied up. I thought, oh, for sure, they'll have me back. But um, that didn't go that way, which is probably best because I got to raise my son for a little while. Um, he's, he's an adult now. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm coming back for sure. And now we're talking about bringing me back again before the end of the season. But they're so tight with their schedule that we have no idea what it's going to be. But, but I love the character. I think they write it so well that, like, he loves being evil so much that that's, that's really fun to play. <laughs> so I was, uh, last night, I was, I was giving Lucas the gears as he's trying to get out of this thing. And I had these giant, chunky speeches, which were really fun. Um, I'm very glad. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks very much. I'll see you later. <laughs> Yeah, I got a, yeah, I'm in, tr I'm in trouble. Hi. Hi. Um, just wanted to ask, um, in the filming of uh, Eureka, were there any plot lines that they had talked about or started but not really pursued that you sort of wish they would have followed up on? Oh, my God, so many. I mean, I, 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 th yeah, they, because they'd always pitch stuff, and the th way it works in television is you pitch it, and the network has to approve it. So they pitch you all this stuff, and then you get to the season, and, and a lot of it sort of falls apart, um, which is normal. Um, I don't remember any offhand, but I remember when they pitched me the, the going back in time and then staying with the timeline that changed. You can't do that, like on television. You can't go back in time and then just leave it different. So I, when they pitched it, I said, oh, that's, that's, that's great. You know you're going to get shot down, though, right? Like, you, you know the network's <laughs> going to say no. And I, I think the network at that point was, um, not that they were done with the show, but they were working on Defiance and they were working on developing all other things. So we were sort of out of mind. They were like, yeah, no, that's great. You know, and, and so we ended up being able to do it, which I think was huge for the show. To put Fargo, to get Fargo running GD mm. was such an important switch for the show. Um, and just so you guys know, Ed left the show because he and his wife had a baby and he didn't want to be apart from from her. I'm apparently okay with it. Um, but, but he's a man of character and substance. And, and it's different for guys like that. So, so he, he went home after, after season two and a half. Um, but I'll, th I'll think on it. I'll think. And, I'll, and I, if I come up with one, I'll, I'll, I'll say it over the course of the thing. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Wait, there was one. It was 1942. They were going to have me go back to 1942. And to the, at the time, it was going to be the creation of Eureka, and it was going to be all, all the military clapboard houses, and he sort of shows up, and there's going to be a night market of scientists where they were sort of uh, uh, sorting them, you know, like, oh, you go over there, you go over there. And so, so it was sort of how the scientists were being chosen was sort of in an, uh, a 1942 night market. I'm so sorry. I'll make this super quick, I promise. <laughs> um, and then, uh, so I had to go back because the sorting of the scientists turned into a consortium which then became the bad force in Eureka. So it was a, it was a story about how, this is long, uh, but it's a story about how you know, the, the, the middle managers become, or, and the bean counters become the powerful people because they become the gatekeepers. So it was a neat, dark story, and we were told no. Um, but I liked it. Please. What was your favorite character you played? My favorite one? Probably... I think from, from a, a character that changed my life and a, and a character that I got to identify with over six years would have to be uh, Jack Carter from, from Eureka. Uh, I, I, I like him. Um, we're not dissimilar, uh, which is probably why it, it worked. Um, 
but I like playing the guys who kill people as well, which is weird to say, <laughs> especially to a smaller human. But, but if I'm being honest, then, then that's also really fun to play. Um, but I've done a lot of sitcom work too, and I really like sitcoms. They're really fun. My greatest sadness is, is um, not my greatest sadness. Like, I'm not that shallow. But um, my greatest sadness is that I didn't get this job. Um, uh, yeah. No, but um, you guys know uh, Stephen Moffat. Uh, he writes, he, yeah, he writes Doctor Who. And, and, and Steve and I met years and years ago because um, I was in the American Coupling, which he also wrote. He wrote the British Coupling, and he did. And the fact that it, not being we were canceled after I think we shot nine episodes, but not being able to do that show with his writing still kills me. And I see uh, him and his wife, you know, uh, uh, I guess not infrequently. And uh, they're such nice people. That's one of the jobs I would have loved to have been able to do um, that I didn't get to do to its fullest. I think. Thank you. I'm sorry I'm sitting up here, but this feels like weird. <laughs> like, so. so I'll put my foot where the next guy sits. That's kind. Uh. Um, you've, been <laughs> <laughs> you've been on See, a See, I kill people. <laughs> All right, so, 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 I'm sorry, please continue. You've been on a lot of different types of shows. Do you remember what your favorite kind was when you were little? Yeah, I mean, when I was little, I loved um, sort of all TV. You know, I, 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 I don't mean to make that a non-answer, but like, I loved sitcoms. I grew up on, on sort of Michael J. Fox on Family Ties. I, I loved, loved that, and he was so good at it, and I'm grateful that when I look back now, I really liked a guy who was really good, because it'd be, it'd be weird if I was like, wow, you know, love that full house. You know, because he's, they're not great. Um, but, but, but he was so good that it's, it's really gratifying to look back and sort of feel like, oh, I, I was on to something, you know, in my life that I gravitated to him so much. Um, he was probably a big influence. Um, Cheers as well was in, was in major reruns at the time. And so I saw that. I've seen every episode of that. And I got to work with Ted Danson at one point, And that was a huge thing for me. Um, because he's obviously wildly, wildly famous. And uh, he was pulling into the parking lot at the same time I was, and he sort of drove a nondescript car. Um, so I was making fun of him for that, as, <laughs> as I do. Um, yeah, that's what you do with your boss. You make fun of him. Um, nice car, Ted. Uh, what a jackass. Uh, but but, but he, he was talking about how he has enough look at me in his life that he doesn't need any more in that sort of thing, and that was never lost on me. And as well as, as a... Uh, the tent pole of the show, he, he was so kind to everybody. And, he, and me, I mean, I, I expected to be cattle because you get called onto a show like that and you figure, you know, you'll do what you're told and, and watch and learn. And he, he constantly, like, do you want to run your lines, you know, to everyone in the cast, not just me. Like, I'm not, a, you know, do you want to run your lines? Uh, he, not like that. But, but he was really kind and I took, I took that with me. So to answer your question, to loop it all together, those sorts of shows I was really into. And then it was nice to, in my career, to be able to work with a couple of those guys and sort of make the circuit complete, if you will. Thanks. Thanks. How about you? What was one of yours? Yeah, keep walking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, no. Or the, what was the second one? The Flintstones. The Flintstones? Yeah, that'd be fantastic. I couldn't be Fred, though. That wouldn't. No. <laughs> Take it away. So, I know it's you again, even without the hat. Yeah, exactly. No, this is a totally different person. Totally different person. Twin or something. Question. Yeah. Yeah. So if there was one show out there that you really want to act in, or since you're a writer, is there a show that, or like a book that you would really want to produce and then act in? Um, yeah, there is. There's, 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 You'd, you'll find that really boring. So, so I'll, I'll do that super great. But um, as far as stuff that's on TV, there is stuff that I love, but I don't necessarily want to act in. Like, I absolutely love Game of Thrones. Like, <laughs> it's phenomenal. I don't think I fit in that world. Um, there, there's, you know, could you imagine? Hello! <laughs> like, bad casting 101. Um, but I'd love to do it. I think, I think, I think that would be amazing. And actually, I, I got to direct Amelia in um, uh, Clark, who plays Daenerys, um, in her first thing out of, out of college. 
which was really fun. And she was phenomenal then. You could just tell like how she, she, she gets it. Um, as far as stuff I'd love to develop, um, gosh, there's so much. Uh, the, the, this is such a bad answer, oh my god. I'll make it quick. Um, the Galois number theory. It's a phenomenally inter interesting story about his life and how he, you know, dead by 20 and created new math that sort of we use today and take for granted. Um, and it's a good story about how an institution or institutionalization can really repress good ideas. Um, and it's with the backdrop against the revolution in France. See, I'm deep, whatever. Um, uh, so I'd, I'd, I'd love to develop that. I think that would be great. For those of you still awake, it's a good story. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, I think, what I'd like to do. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Colin. Hello. I uh, just wanted to say, first off, thank you very much to you and the cast of Haven for promoting Odenburg County. That's oh. where I'm from. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. I hope you, you enjoy shooting down there. I did. I, was, I shot there. I was, I was directing down there, I guess, two weeks ago Wednesday, and it was the one sunny day we had, so thank you for that. <laughs> Sorry about that. That <laughs> happens a lot. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, on Eureka, you often bore the brunt of a lot of technological misadventures. Yes. Uh, what, what are your feelings on how Eureka kind of educated us on that as we become more technological ourselves? Well, a couple things on that. Um, it was like first season and the writers come to me really excited and they're like, we found something that really works for the show. And I was like, great, what? And it's like, when you're in pain, it seems to go great. So, <laughs> so for like six years, they would be like, oh, Colin falls down the stairs. Great. You know, so, so they... They loved it when my character was either angry or in pain or suffering. They're like, oh, it's gold. So I don't know what that says about them. Um, yeah. So there, there's that. But we started doing the show. When we started doing the show, we had the, those little PDAs that we use, super, super small. And um, I remember as, as actors who are not technological people, you know, we're like, there's not even a keyboard on this thing. This is ridiculous. <laughs> like, you know, you get it and you're like, how is that supposed to work? That'll never fly the iPhone comes out two years later, you know, and so we go, oh! And those things were the bane of our existence because they, they, we never had holders for them. So you'd be doing a scene where, you know, you're over here and you're doing some scene, whatever, Fargo's office, and uh, there's a, that huge background behind you. And invariably, someone going up the stairs or coming down would drop this thing. And it's <laughs> metal, it's made of you know, stainless steel, so you'd be doing the scene, you hear, tink, 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 tink as this thing goes everywhere. So we lost so many takes to those things, and uh, we were not kind about it. We were like, oh, for the crown of God! Because um, everything has to be super quiet or you have to re redo it. Um, so that's that part of it. And you, you, there was another thing. The... Well, basically, how do you feel it's educated us going forward? I oh, mean, your question. Everything, yeah, right. today. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> not a good listener. Um, yeah. um, how I think it's educated people, I, I'd like to think, and I, I I don't think that the show necessarily, there would have been another show that did it if ours, if ours didn't, but it's really cool to meet people who said, you know, oh, I, I watched your show and now I'm an engineer. I really found uh, a kinship in that world and then found it on my own. Uh, and that's really exciting to hear, uh, to kids going into science and going into, into stuff because they saw it on TV. That's sort of the point of TV is to tell stories that people can then use as a compass to, to go through their lives. For me, it was the sitcoms that, that <laughs> cause I'm shallow. Um, <laughs> you know, anything more than 21 minutes, nah, I'm asleep. Uh, but, but you know, I, 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 that sort of comedy, I gravitated towards and, and tried to replicate in my own way. Um, but if the show d taught or gave something, I hope it's that, that there's a community and a kinship in academia that's, that it, that's honorable to pursue. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Who's that? <laughs> oh, they're having a conversation. Sorry. Hi. Oh, hey, Matt. That, I'm right here. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear you. <laughs> okay. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm just wondering if you had always intended to go into this genre, or if it was something you just stumbled into. It's something I stumbled into. I, I, I mean, I'd love to say that, uh, you know, you just go out for auditions and, and you go where the industry throws you. I know some people are more picky, but I, I believe in, not fate, but um, just give, give everything your best and you'll go where you're supposed to go. Well, you know, don't overthink it. it it's, uh, the world will tell you where you're supposed to be. It makes no bones about it. So, you know, you'll, you'll get there. Um, 
But as an actor, I mean, I mean, I was painfully shy as a kid. I was an academic. I was a, I was a science, math, smart guy. Uh, yeah, totally, yeah. Um, and I couldn't even speak in class till I was like 16, 17. Like I couldn't, that was not my go-to. I, I, it was beyond me. So it's a weird thing. In college, I needed money. Um, and so I started doing comedy in bars because I needed money. Like that's how I ended up here. <laughs> Weird, um, but but uh, it loops back to what to, to your question in a weird way because um, and now I can't make the loop in my head, which is sad. Um, but what was your question one more time? I'll loop it back. Um, did you intend to go into this type of genre? Or uh, yeah, yeah, I, it's, I didn't. Yeah, that was it. I didn't int even intend to go into this line of work, um, let alone the genre. What did so you intend to do? Um, I didn't know. I knew I worked in a bank for three days one summer, and that did that. <laughs> That didn't go well. I planted trees in the Canadian North for a while. That was, I'm from Montreal, so that's a terrible job. Um, my brother did it for 10 years, so I guess it's not. But, but um, I did all sorts of jobs. I was a waiter, um, but that was my family too. We always had weird, my brother was the Skippy's peanut, like the planter's peanut um, forever. How do you get into that? Like, we're, we're like we're, we are a family that gets into really weird lines of work. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, think, I think there's something in, in not having an attention at all and to sort of just do, do what you're supposed to do, do what gives you a good response. And the counterpoint to that is there's a great 30 for 30 documentary on a, a football player who all the gears, all the talent, just didn't want to do it. And so at the peak, he just sort of walked away. So there's, there's an element of that as well. You know, just because you're good at it doesn't mean you have to do it, you know, for anyone here who's, who's, who's thinking about that. So there's a, it's, I don't know. Um, I didn't have any intention on going into this, but I'm glad that I did. It taught me a lot. Also, I went into it before sci-fi really took off mainstream. So what it's done is it's given me a huge facility for that kind of work. Uh, green screen, special effects, all that stuff, which, are, which is second nature at this point, and is now um, really marketable. So it's, it's been handy. Cool. Thanks. I know. Thank you. I made a mess of that answer, didn't I? <laughs> Hi. How are you today? I'm all right. How are you doing? Awesome. Uh, firstly, I want to welcome you to Nova Scotia. Thank you very much. Hope you're enjoying it. I am. Um, what I wanted to know was, given that you've been in some fairly involved characters, yeah, uh, is it a is it an issue for you coming out of the character at the end of it, or during uh, getting too involved in the role, becoming the role in in your real life? No. Not for me now, and I think that's different as you go through your life. I think when you're younger, there's a temptation to adopt certain character traits of a character and bring them into your own life, partially because you don't know who you are. You know, you, you get these, these kids doing these shows at 19 through 26. That's, you know, seven years doing a show. That's almost twice as long as a university degree, that you're doing one character. So a lot of them, you know, buy their own hype, and not out of any arrogance, but just because they don't know who they are yet. Um, by the time they get to 40, they've probably sorted it out. So at this point, no. I leave it at the office and, and it's, it's done there. But it's really nice to do a character where you do discover something about yourself. You know, and, and I've joked a lot about it, but playing those murderers and those, oh, fuck off. Uh, it, it, it's, it's going somewhere. I know, but when you're playing those, those evil people, you know, you do, going to those darker places is an interesting thing for your mind because you, you develop certain parts of yourself. You learn to say things that you wouldn't say, otherwise you're like, oh, that's fun. Um, so, so you do pull things back into your own life in a good way, you know, um, and it's a safe place to do it. In the end, is it a process for you coming out of it and being able to leave it all at the office? Um, as far as leaving the character and returning to me, no, I can do that, uh, flip a switch, and at this point in my career, you know, I've been cool. doing it for 20 years, but it is a process to leave set on set and not bring it back to my home. You know, you're, you, you're constantly on because you have to be on and you got people in your face all day long and there's a re-entry process, much like a space shuttle re-entering the atmosphere, when you, when you come back into your home life. And I know all, all the actors do it. They all get into fights with their, with their significant others because you go from, you know, it's all about work, it's 16 hours a day, you're in your hotel room, you know, and production makes it all about work. You know, do you know your lines and all this stuff? And um, and then you go home and it's not about you at all. 
you know, it's about your wee one who wants to, you know, throw a block inside of a pail for 20 minutes. You're like, that's boring. But, but you, 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 you do it, and you're like, it's amazing, buddy, do it again. Um, you know, so there, there's a little bit of that. And, and, and so that's the harder bit for me, is, cool. is changing gears and, and being more graceful about it. Right on. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Just one thing uh, that I'm thinking of a lot of these shows, and um, this, we're in a world of hype. Most things are hyped up. And then yeah. you get shows like Eureka, which come off with very low hype, and all of a sudden you get these phenomenal shows with great acting, great writers, great stories. And within a couple of weeks after finding it by accident, you're going through the channels trying to figure out when it's on next. Yeah. So I just want to thank some of these shows that have sort of come out captured our attention and have become some of the shows that we have spent the time finding. Oh, thank you. Thanks very much. That's, that's, it's, it's an honor to be a part of that list. I mean, uh, that's great. Um, it's a tough thing being on a network that doesn't have much money. You know, and and it's, it's a reality to the, to the thing. You're trying to compete against you know, HBO? Forget it. Or you know, some of those big network shows that can just hurl money at their product and you know, like all the fall launch shows that you hear about every year. Like, how many of them are any good? Um, that was off, Mike, wasn't it? But, uh, uh, but they're not. And, and so it's, 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 a, it's a funny thing to be a part of a, back when cable was new. When Eureka started, one of the problems was that sci-fi was not a part of basic cable. And this is a weird thing that we deal with that you don't really think about. So market saturation was really light. And then all of a sudden in year three, it became a part of basic cable. So people started catching up on it. At the same time, Netflix came out. So it had this sort of surge in the middle that wasn't being clocked by the network. Because in their mind, oh, it was done. You know, it was like, oh, it's in year three, it'll go five years and whatever. And they didn't really get that the show was, as, was doing as well as it did until they tried to bring out their next shows and they didn't do as well. You know, Alphas came out and it was gone in two years. Defiance came out and I don't know where that is now, but it's, it costs so much money to make that they needed a, a bigger response than they got. So. Um, it's a funny thing, and I don't think the metrics are accurate. I know this is so boring. Is this boring? Okay. I don't think the, me like that whole Nielsen rating thing is ridiculous. Like in this day and age, it's all about where you watch it, and as far as downloading illegally, do it. Like, I mean, you gotta teach them that that's how we're getting our, our, our stuff, and once they learn that's how we're getting our stuff, they'll build, a, they'll build in a business model that works, which is, you know, you know, if they, if they brought it out all over the world at the same time, they wouldn't have this issue. But they have it on these weird schedules and no one can follow it. So, so yeah, do what you do. They'll find it. That's what I say. And he never worked again. Uh, two more questions? Ask. <laughs> I have a 27-part question. <laughs> no, no. Um, you, you seem to take a, a kind of delight in playing, like, murder-happy, horrible characters. Um, I do. What would it actually I take? get to kill so few people in my real life. That's the real tragedy, it's isn't it? It's just a joy, yeah. Uh, what would it actually take to scare you? Like, what, what actually scares oh, you? Oh, a giant wuss. I'm a, I have no, I, I can't watch any horror movie. I'm such a pain to watch. If, you, if I'm watching a sitcom where the characters made two dates for the same night, I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> I can't, I can't. There's something about the morality of it that I was like, that's wrong, you can't do that. You know, and, and I'm, I'm, I went to see I, a bunch of friends when I was still trying to appear vaguely masculine. Um, they, they, they took me to see Scream in the theater. And uh, it was me and I think eight nine-year-old girls at the back of the theater like this. <laughs> like I can't, I can't watch horror. I can't watch, um, my suspension of disbelief is huge. So um, other people here are like, oh, that's a pretty cool music swell. And I've almost had a heart attack at that point. So. So in television, I can't watch anything that's, that's remotely scary. Um, in real life, I'm fine with almost anything, <laughs> it's, I, uh, which is weird. Because I skydive and I do all sorts of stuff and it doesn't really bother me. Um, but on, on screen, it's, uh, I can't watch stuff. How about yourself? You're a horror guy? I'm uh, 
not as sque I'm squeamish now as I'm older. Like when I was a kid, I was like, oh yeah, predator. <laughs> right, right, right. But like now it's like, oh my god, what is this family going to think about it? Well, and also, but, but and if it's just gory, my mind goes like, oh, that stuff is so sticky. Because <laughs> I, I just jump back to work, right? And I'm like, oh my god, I wonder how long they had to lie there. That's awful. Because you can see it and it's on their clothes and it's stuck and I've been there and it's terrible. It's, oh, bad answer? All right. Sorry, guys. Oh, it's good. It's all good. All right. Thanks. Take care. Last question. Will it be a good one? What's with the Jeeps? <laughs> How did that start? You said they had a low budget. Yeah. You keep blowing those things up yeah. like crazy. Yeah, they did. We, had, um, they, we went through, I guess, the, the numbers vary, but I think it was 14 actual Jeeps that we bought because we'd keep repurposing them. We had a graveyard of Jeeps out back. And um, uh, why did it start? It started because they realized that when my character was, as I said, sort of in pain or struggling, it was funny. I mean, for the first season, my foot was broken. For the last season, my shoulder was dislocated. I was burned. I had concussions. It was, it was a source of incredible joy to them um, to see, you know, could they burn me or would I, would I keep acting, <laughs> you know? Um, so burning or destroying the Jeeps was a way to sort of get under my skin, which is a, a tone they felt worked. Um, about the Jeeps, though, we ran out of them. They couldn't, ha like, they had no more in the province, uh, in the province of British Columbia. Um, we, had to, we had to start outsourcing them in the States. And so in the later seasons, they were, the only place we could get them were firehouses. So they were red on the inside, uh, and we had to sort of spray paint them. And they were only good for what they were good for. So we had some Jeeps that were exterior Jeeps that you could drive into town with. Um, oddly, the exterior Jeeps, the seat wasn't attached. So I sat, and they're like, look, for safety, you gotta wear your seat belt. I'm like, but the seat isn't attached. I'm driving on sandbags. There were two sandbags underneath my seat, and I had to buckle up. I was like, ah, oh, it's nice. Um, as long as it looks safe. Um, and then there were other ones that were interior Jeeps, where actually all the stuff worked. Because you'd get a Jeep, and like, oh, is this the one where the lights work? They're like, no, nah, lights don't work. So it was, it was always a different Jeep. Um, and yeah, I guess that's the story with the Jeep. There you go. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you guys very much. Is there, it looks like there's one more. Oh, you guys know? All right. Well, I got to get going. They're kicking me off. Um, thank you guys very, very much. I really appreciate it. So I'll see you guys later. Thank you. <clears throat> Alcon.